Hi, and welcome to Something to Talk About. I'm Linda McNamee, and for the next 58 minutes to an hour, we are going to be talking about suicide prevention as well as how to cope if, um, if your life has been affected somehow by suicide. But before I begin, you are more than willing to give us a call this evening at 781 two seven zero nine one nine nine if you have a question for our guests and if you have a question after the fact and forget to write down the email or forget to write down the phone number you are more than willing to give me a, a send me a note uh, at talk at bcattv.org also if you have a question follow up tonight or if you have a suggestion for a future topic I would love to hear from you and as usual, I would like to thank this evening's crew for giving up their Wednesday evening and coming and helping me out. We have Kyle Ruffin and Corey McNeil, who are staff members here at BCAT, who help keep this place running and help us, all of us volunteers. We also have Chris Flaherty, Colleen Moore, Colleen, director extraordinaire, uh, Maddie Shipka, and Mike Shipka. So thank you guys for giving up your Wednesday evening to come and give me a hand. And last, but definitely not least, I want to thank my husband, Paul, for staying home for daddy date night. Hopefully you're not stuck playing the Lego video game again. Okay, now down to business. I would love to introduce my wonderful guest for this evening. We have Mark Goldblatt, who is the past president, correct, of correct. the Greater Boston chapter, chapter of the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention. Hi. That's a really long title. It sure is, and uh, we've been working to prevent suicide for many years now, and uh, probably uh, at least 20 years in the greater Boston area. I've been involved with the AFSP mm -hmm. in Boston since 2001. Okay. We will talk about that very shortly. And I would also like to introduce Jeannie Dawson. Yes. Who is a volunteer. I am a volunteer. And you are working at for the North Shore and Wakefield I am walk. I am the the founder and chairperson of the of of the Wakefield Walk for Suicide Prevention also called the North Shore Walk for Suicide Prevention and we're going to talk about that a lot more that's why we call it something to talk about so thank you guys very much for coming and pleasure. you guys get to fight over who gets to start talking but first I'd like to find out, and I'm sure the viewers would also like to find out a little bit more about how you came to the greater Boston area, um, possibly where you went to school, how you got involved in suicide prevention. I came to Boston in 1983 for my residency training. I did my training at a place called Westeros Park Mental Health Center, which is where the, the old Boston State Hospital was. Okay. And afterwards, in uh, 1986, I went to McLean Hospital, where I've been ever since. I was running a depression unit on um, McLean Hospital, and I noticed how many people tried to kill themselves by really violent and terrible means. And I was struck by that, and then uh, at that point, one of my, well, my boss was interested in writing a chapter on how to treat these people, and he asked me to be involved. And I got involved in suicide studies through that. And uh, through that, I met other wonderful people who are very committed to trying to understand what brings somebody to suicide and how we can deal with it and how we can prevent it. Wow. That's pretty intense. Well, <laughs> it's very intense seeing uh, people that you care about mm -hmm. getting so desperate that they want to think about trying to hurt themselves and kill themselves. Wow. Okay, more about the causes of that later. Jeannie, can you fill us in a little bit? Yep, I'm born and bred on the North Shore, lived in Wakefield my entire life, and um, I came to know about AFSP, uh, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, um, because I lost my cousin, who also happened to be my childhood best friend, to suicide in 2009. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was actually at her home hours before she uh, took her life, and 
um, just through talking to other people, I found out about the foundation. And by scoping out their website, there was a little button that said, to organize your own walk, click here. So Wakefield has our beautiful lake. I thought I'd get 20 people would walk around the lake and call it a day. Well, hundreds and thousands of people later and, wow. and over $500,000 later, we are now in entering our sixth year. You read my mind, I was about to say. So how long have you been doing this? Since, two, uh, well, 2010 was our inaugural walk. Um, it took a year of planning to get the first one off the ground, and now they just pretty much roll. Run themselves. Right. So when's the next one? Um, w the, the community walks, there are actually six of them in eastern Massachusetts, okay. all under the Boston chapter. Um, there's one on the North Shore, okay. one in the Concord, uh, Car Concord area for the Route 2 corridor. There's one in Lowell. There's one in Buzzards Bay to service the South Shore and the Cape. There's one in Worcester. And uh, the season always ends with um, the walk in Boston towards the end of October. But they typically run um, any time from Labor Day um, right up till Thanksgiving all mm -hmm. over the country um, because National Suicide Survivors Day is um, in November every year as well. So it kind of starts off um, with the walks and rolls out into that. Um, we do every year, um, the AFSP also has a wonderful event called the Overnight Walk, okay. which um, thousands and thousands and thousands of people come from around the country. They used to only have one, now they do have that traveled around the country. Now they have one that moves about the western part of the country and one that moves about the okay. eastern part of the country. And this year it is right here at home in Boston. Yeah. Um, for the second time in five years. So that's very exciting, um, mostly because of the awareness that it's bringing to people and the, um, the healing that it brings to those who are already well too familiar. And the one in Boston is in June. It's, okay. it's rolling up quickly. Um, you can get information on that um, on um, the various websites. Okay. I believe you have that information scrolling yeah. um, or will. It will appear. Uh, it will appear. Um, but the the walks give you a place to come together as a community, um, whether you're struggling personally okay. or if um, you have lost someone. Uh, it gives you a place to, to join other people um, like who feel the system. feel the same way you do, who okay. can look you in the face and say, "I know," and they do. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about suicide itself. How big of a problem is it? Because it really isn't talked about. Much. Well, it's not talked about much, and that's unfortunate because it's a huge problem. It's probably the third leading cause of death for young people, adolescents, and uh, young adults, and it's about the eighth leading cause of death for adults. Um, usually, the figures that we cite are about 40,000 per year in the United States, and wow. in Massachusetts, it's around nine per hundred thousand, so it's, it's a significant amount. Now, how has that changed over the past five or ten years? Is it ga growing or is it kind of becoming less or can... You know, st statistically it's probably much the same. There's a fluctuation up and down. We saw a decrease in the 1990s and we're not exactly sure why that happened but it might be because of the new drugs, the selective serotoninergic oh, okay. ones like Prozac and Zoloft that came on board and were effective. Okay. And then there's been a slight increase recently, and it's not clear if that's due to the bad economy or what really caused it. Yeah. And the, re the change in reporting, um, they've gotten better about reporting deaths that previously had gone... Oh, uh, okay. Right. The, the reporting has changed the statistics a lot over the yeah. years okay. as well. So the insiders so the might have... The reporting is actually more accurate. The reporting's more accurate. Okay. So we the insiders so. might have always known the numbers, but what's being presented to the public, if they see any of the charts or things that are out there, the waves on those um, have changed because of some okay. of the reporting. Now, is there a special terminology that should be used in talking about suicide? Well, I, I just think people should talk about it. Okay. It's this making it a secret and making it a stigma that keeps it in the darkness and makes people feel so awful about it. Suicide is really associated with depression, and okay. depression, like other mental illnesses, just doesn't get talked about enough. So any way that we can talk about uh, emotional experience and illness, I think is helpful. Now, is do people that attempt to commit suicide, are they 
always clinically depressed or is that just like a trend? No, it's always, we found that suicide is always, or just about always associated with mental illness. Okay. And almost always that mental illness is depression. Okay. Uh, the studies show that it's about anywhere between 45 to 85 percent, but in my experience, it's it's very close to 95 to 100 percent. Okay. People always have a mental illness driving it, and almost always it's a illness associated with depression. It okay. can be bipolar illness. Okay. I was and sometimes people with schizophrenia get depressed and kill themselves, okay. and sometimes people with borderline personality disorder get depressed and kill themselves. Okay. But depression always comes in, so it wouldn't just be a bipolar person in, well, bipolar is manic depressive, isn't it? The old term was manic depressive. Bipolar okay. really refers to people who have depression and sometimes ah, okay. get hyper-energized and get into a high energy state. And they can try and, uh, they can get desperate and think about killing themselves in both states. Okay. But almost always it's in a depressive state. Now, are there instances that someone might not have been diagnosed with depression? Like if somebody found out that they have a terminal illness where they just decide, no, I don't want to go through chemo treatments and you know, if they had like diagnosed with cancer, they just want to. Well, you would, you would think, but really mm -hmm. the studies show that okay. the people who kill themselves with these terrible illnesses like cancer or uh, other chronic illnesses, they're depressed as well, because not all cancer patients kill themselves. In fact, very few okay. do. So people with uh, terrible, debilitating illnesses seem to only kill themselves okay. when they've given up and feel depressed. Okay, and I'm depression is a treatable illness. Because okay. I was just wondering, like, with the whole terminal illness aspect of it, recently in the news there was that woman who moved to Washington State because it had the um, Death with Dignity Act, I think it was called, um, and like uh, Jack Kevorkian with the assisted suicides. I was just wondering how that played a role in what you were trying to accomplish. Well, you have to be very careful. People want to kill themselves when they're desperate and depressed, and usually that can be, that can be treated. Okay. Are there, got to look at my notes here, um, what types of, what's like the target audience? Is it mostly young people, like between the ages of 15 and 30, or is it older people? Is it, you know, male versus female, you know? Well, we really want to let everybody know that if they have a depression, it can be treated. Okay. Turns out that younger women tend to self-harm. That means cut themselves okay. or hurt themselves in some way or try and kill themselves, but not usually as lethal. It's older okay. men who are more lethal. Okay. So Why do you think that is? I think it's access to means. Okay. So men usually have access to a gun or to using a rope to hang themselves. Uh, younger women usually try and cut themselves, overdose on pills. Okay. Um, the, more, the more dangerous the means you use, the more likely it'll go through. Okay. Now, Within the past, I don't know, five years or so, it seems like bullying in schools has become a lot more prevalent and anti-bullying techniques and um, or just awareness of adult intervention because there have been high school students that have committed suicide because of bullying, whether it be cyberbullying or I don't know what in person is called. How has that impacted well, suicide Everything. is complex, you know, okay. so this problem with bullying is a terrible one. But not everybody who gets bullied kills himself or herself. And we don't quite understand what's the connection between okay. f being bullied and then feeling so desperate that you try and kill yourself. We have to approach both problems. We have to do something about bullying, which mm -hmm. is totally unacceptable. And we have to do something about the depression that these young kids fall into when they feel that they've got nowhere to turn and uh, feeling persecuted at school and shamed and uh, feeling like there's no recourse. Now, how would someone know if they were clinically depressed or if they were just sad? Well, clinical depression is very different from regular sadness. All of us feel sad. Mm -hmm. In English, we use the same word, depressed, 
to recognize a mood and to recognize a mental illness, and that's part of the difficulty. But with a clinical depression, the mood lasts for a long time. Usually it's a sad or irritable mood for at least two weeks. Okay. Uh, people have energy disturbance, and with depression, the energy is very low. It's hard to get up in the morning. It's hard to find energy to concentrate. It's hard mm -hmm. to do your work. It's hard to um, do, get any enjoyment from the things you normally like. Sleep gets affected. Usually people have disturbed sleep. Sometimes they might sleep too much, okay. but they can also complain of not getting enough sleep or not, f not getting any not sleep. Not feeling they feel rested. Or definitely not feeling rested. They feel agitated. Um, appetite is disturbed. Often people say they have no appetite. Sometimes they can say they have too much appetite and they gain weight. But mostly mood is down and people think of killing themselves. They feel so desperate and uh, they give up hope. The hopelessness and helplessness is associated with depression. Now what should someone Oh, oh, I just wanted to comment because you specifically use the term more than sad. AFSP has a wonderful program that they, um, they offer to um, the school environment for school-aged children as well as a program for educators and the program is called More Than Sad okay. and it's a program where they can educate the educators on how, how to recognize the differences um, okay. and they educate the students on how to recognize the difference so if they have a friend who to tell are they sad or are they more than sad um, so if that's something that if any educators do happen to be watching okay. your program tonight um, think that their environment could benefit from that um, I would encourage them to reach out to the Greater Boston chapter okay. um, of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention because they can certainly um, get them the tools that they need to be able to roll out that program another thing that goes along with depression is people's use of alcohol and substances increases so people try and treat the bad feeling that they have by drinking more. Unfortunately, it's alcohol... Like escaping it. Well, it's alcohol is a depressant. It's a central nervous system okay. depressant, so it makes it even worse. Okay. So it's usually like the depression that... Um, I'm thinking of the proverbial chicken versus egg, so it's usually the depression comes first and then the drug... Yeah, people and try and sometimes try and treat depression with alcohol without okay. uh, getting uh, regular treatment from... Self-medicating. Yeah, from a okay. doctor or from the, the school clinic. Okay. Now, what are some of the signs that the average non-depressed person can look for if they know someone who is possibly contemplating suicide? Like, had you known, you know, not to. No, bring that's up what I, bad speak feelings, very, I speak. I speak. But very I'm like you had it. mentioned that you were with your cousin that evening and you didn't know. Are there certain signs, hindsight, that you should have been looking for? Should's just a really right. strong word, um, so. In my, in my personal experience, um, it was a little different because as it had turned out, um, she had attempted several times over the years mm -hmm. that we all knew about, but you make excuses. In, until, until it really happens to you, you make a lot of excuses until you become more aware because again, it wasn't something that was being talked about when I was growing up. Okay. It was that thing you saw happen on the news and it didn't happen in hometown America. So um, the, the, you, you saw the things that he, he would talk about. She was in insomniac, she never slept. She was up all the time, she would get three hours sleep. Um, she would often go out for walks in the middle of the night and dress entirely in black so she couldn't be seen because she wanted to disappear. I mean, she showed all, uh, she showed a lot of a lack of self-worth, lack of value, self-value, um, excessively upset over situations that other people could handle um, okay. in, a, in a more constructive way. Um, there, there were a lot of signs and symptoms there. Um, okay. it, it, self medication, et cetera, um, promiscuity, um, different things that, that just um, were telltale signs. Uh, risky and behavior. And if it's just one thing, then. Right. It really isn't an issue, but if more things... Well, no, the, the thing is that those are all the signs and symptoms of depression. Okay. But not everybody with depression tries to kill themselves. Okay. Only about 5, 10, maybe 15, 20% do. So how do you know oh, 20 which... 20% seems pretty high. It's very high, yeah. 
Well, that's how we get the figure of 40,000 Americans okay. a year. Wow. And so, you know, one of the things you're asking is, how do you know? Well, all you know is can what... You know? Yes, you can know when somebody's depressed. Now, one of the feelings that goes along with depress depression is guilt. People with depression often suffer terribly from guilt and feeling that they're not good enough or they've done some bad things and they end up self-hating and feeling that they should be punished. And the trouble is when somebody does die by suicide, the rest of us feel guilt too. We think we should have picked it up. There must have been something I could have seen, I could have done. Trouble is it's difficult. Depression is quite common and we see it. But I would say if you see somebody with depression, make sure they're getting help. Try and get them to see a doctor, see a psychiatrist, see an emergency ward, see a school counselor, see a pastor, see somebody. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. Um, so basically you answered my next question, my little cheat sheet here. Best practices for approaching someone who might be contemplating suicide, encourage them to get help. How would you know where to go to get help? Would, it, would a good starting place be a primary care physician or your website or referral if you know someone else? Or Well, I would say start with the medical profession. Go to okay. your primary care doctor. If it's a student, go to the school nurse, go to the counseling system. Okay. If um, somebody out of school and they've got a job, go to the workplace um, HR person. Or if you're out of work, go to the emergency ward. Anywhere that you go to that they can diagnose depression and treat it. Okay. What, what would you say, Jeannie? What, where do you, uh, um, you send them? Being, being the, on the other end of that, um, and in hindsight. Um, Hindsight's always 20. Hindsight is always, um, if, if you're in, if, if concern is imminent, do, do not leave them alone. A okay. Absolutely do not leave them that's, alone. That's a very good um, point. Okay. And what I have to say as a complete layperson, I am not a professional, I am not in anything, I am somebody who lost my best friend and cousin to suicide. Call anybody and everybody, do not leave them alone, and I don't care if it's the police. You get whoever you need to get there to help. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of um, times when, when you're trying to get help, particularly when it's with individuals who are over 18 years of age, they want to talk to that individual. Um, they want them to be the one to ask for help. So sometimes you need to be rather assertive and just keep crying for help until you have. Be blunt. Tact goes out and the window. Well, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. If it has to be the police, it has mm -hmm. to be the police. Because at some t at some point, you're going to spark a, um, a reaction from the individual that you're concerned about mm -hmm. that will concern the others around them. Well, Jeannie's making a really good point, which is that you have to take it seriously. The consequences of missing it are so dire. Now, Jeannie had said something earlier about how it only happens on TV and it never happens in our neighborhood or it never happens in our family. You know, recently, you know, I saw the flyer for your upcoming overnight walk as well as recently in the news, Robin Williams committed suicide. And like many people, I just, it hit me like a ton of bricks because here he was a comedian and he always seemed happy. Now, how has his death impacted the work that both of you are doing? Is it helping bring it to light? Is it still? Just, mm -hmm. just as you're saying that people who we don't even think of who might be depressed, by his death, I think he has made, it more, made us more aware that people can put on a happy face and really have a lot of pain underneath. Mm -hmm. And when the pain gets too much, they think of doing these awful things to themselves. Robin Williams' death was a horrible tragedy that has affected millions of people and has made a lot of people who were thinking about suicide mm -hmm. very scared. Also people who had no awareness of his problems suddenly are confronted by why did this man do it? Now, of course, we don't know why he did it. And of often we don't know why people kill themselves. We don't know. 
We, uh, we think it has to do with desperation. We think it has to do with overwhelming sadness or mm -hmm. some terrible feelings that they're dealing with. But we really don't know, and talking to somebody in such a dire straits is the only way we can find out. Now, sometimes I've heard, like, people accuse those who have committed suicide to have taken the easy way out, or it was very selfish of them to do it. Do you see that as being like a self-centered, pra not, not practice, but a self-centered act? Or do you think that there's something else involved? Well, I'm a psychiatrist, so I come at this from a medical model. Okay. People try and kill themselves when they're desperate. They don't know any other way to do things they want to do. They're really at their wit's end. They don't know what else to do. They're suffering from a horrible illness. Usually it's depression, and usually it's unbearable psychic pain that causes them to try and kill themselves. I think it's... Um, overly romanticizing to say that they're um, taking the easy way out or that they're self-centered. We really don't know what they're going through. Again, it gets to mm -hmm. trying to know what's on their mind as they're suffering. And it goes back to my point. If you see somebody who is in that place, talk to them or get them help. And don't leave them alone. Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, again, you don't always see it. It was not evident to me that night um, that that was going to be the night. Um, I actually have to say that she was quite resolved that evening. It was, it was, a, it was fairly a peaceful evening for us um, in our visit. Um, and like, as soon as I did find out about her death later, I immediately knew that she had taken her own life. I, it, there was no doubt in my mind, um, but I did not see it coming that evening. Okay. Because I think I've heard like a lot of times the person has resolved everything and they're at peace finally because they have made this decision. I, you don't, I, you also don't want to overly romanticize that because, okay. because that, that, mm. send, that sends the wrong message as well. Um, what the, the, the point I want to make going back to okay. the taking the easy way out. Okay. It cannot possibly be easy because knowing my cousin, she would have never left her children. They were adult children, mm -hmm. but she would have never left her children. It had to have been the most excruciating decision for her to have made to actually leave them. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine the place that she was in, in her mind and in her illness, that actually got her to that point. So it is, I, I would say by no, by no means, is it the easy way out? I think the resolution that I speak of, the calm, mm -hmm. was that calm before the storm. Okay. No, I don't mean to right. like no, 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 no. it. I know. know. That's I, why I, have I you just, guys I, here. I, 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 I know that you understand. Okay. I just am being cautious of those yes. who may be. No, that's Maybe why I want to talk about this because I want, want I, I, in no way, shape, or form is it mm -hmm. ever okay my, my, my for those of us you leave behind. My experience of people who are getting close to killing themselves are very agitated. It's a very difficult state to be in physically and emotionally. It's a difficult state to be in. I've never seen this calm state that's romanticized okay. or Hollywood might show us. People are having a really huff, tough time when they think about doing something so catastrophic as killing themselves. And I had a two hour dinner. She may have been trying very hard for everything to be as normal as possible. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't want to romanticize. Exactly. I want to find out the facts. I want to find out the correct terminology. And, you know, I think that the, it's, the public needs to know this so we can lower that statistic. Because the, the important, the, the real important message to get out there is that mental illness is illness. It is illness. You're often um, criticized. Oh, just get over it. Uh, like yes, everybody has problems, yeah. pull up your bootstraps or whatever. And mental illness is illness. Um, you wouldn't be blamed for having cancer. You wouldn't be blamed for ha be having diabetes. Um, you, you wouldn't be, uh, whatever the word is, ostracized or whatever, um, for having any, any other 
thing that mm -hmm. needed to be treated and or medicated. So if you need to be treated and or medicated for mental illness, you can have a wonderful, fulfilling life if you manage your illness. Just like the diabetic who Needs the takes insulin. their insulin, they can still have their hot fudge Sunday if they want to, as long as they, Ooh, as, as long as they control what they need to control to be able to live life fulfilled. Well, Jeannie's making a good point that these illnesses are terrible illnesses, but they're treatable. We can treat depression. We have good psychotherapies and good medication to treat depression. We can treat psychosis. We have good medications and treatments for schizophrenia. And we do have treatments for borderline personality disorder. So all these things are treatable. Mm -hmm. It just does take effort, time, money, and commitment. Now, if someone were depressed, in some cases, could medication not be used? Well, the, stu the, the studies show that psychotherapy, that's talking therapy, right. is very effective for treatment of depression. They also show that psychopharmacology, that's medication, is okay. very effective for the treatment of depression. And further show that the combination is the best, has the best outcome. Okay. So people can take medication, they can take psychotherapy, they can take both, as long as they take something. As long as they my, take something. My only thing is I want them proactive. to be treated. I don't want depression not to be treated because it gets worse. Depression is one of those illnesses that can get worse and worse, and there's a mortality associated, as I said, right, okay. 5, 10, 15 percent, to try and kill themselves. And, and depression gets worse and it weighs on you. And communication with your doctor. It, 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 it's sometimes trial and error when it does come to medications and treatments. Mm -hmm. D just because they prescribe it to you doesn't mean it's the magic fix. It, right. if, if you're suffering other symptoms on that medication, be honest with your doctor. Be uh, talk, On this whole topic, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. Whether, whether you're feeling suicidal, whether mm -hmm. you're feeling depressed, um, mental illness, whether you're the loved one, the person struggling personally, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. It needs to be talked about. It needs to be talked about with your family. It needs to be talked about with your friends. It needs to be talked about with the medical professionals. Okay. Now, another, you had said that, I th think you had said that your cousin had attempted suicide prior. Yes. Is there a support system available, like either through your website or through doctors or something, for people who have gone as far as attempting to take their own life and failed? Because I would think that right there would bring you even, potentially make you even more depressed. Is there a support system for suicidal oh, individuals? I, I, I don't think people consider it a failure if they didn't kill themselves. Some people are glad that they didn't okay. succeed and kill themselves. Some people are ambivalent. More often people feel ambivalently about living and dying and treatment can help them resolve that okay. and stay alive. Um, as to support systems, um, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention is one place that you can go to our website and see what we offer. There's other organizations that do that too. Uh, NAMI does help for people with, me with mental illness as, the, as does um, bipolar and depression organization. And Samaritans is another local organization. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember like the bridge going over into the Cape. There's the sign. I, I just know they're available. I, I'm okay. not familiar I with them. I just remember seeing the sign. So we do have a phone call. You were right. Hi, do you have a question for our guests this evening? Uh, yeah, this is uh, Greg uh, calling in. Uh, uh, many years ago, uh, my mother's been dead for uh, uh, a number of years, but uh, a few years before uh, she died, she, uh, you know, uh, Kinley uh, would say, uh, I'd like to uh, pay uh, Jack Kevorkian a visit. That's how I feel because she had pretty serious arthritis and every day was becoming uh, tougher and tougher. But uh, I being an, uh, you know, an Orthodox Christian, if you commit suicide, the uh, church will not bury you. So, you know, they have certain... Um, uh, statutes about uh, suicide, 
But I also found that, uh, at least in uh, my case, because uh, I uh, once had, uh, uh, up until uh, just about two years ago, one of my cousins, he was a church deacon, and one of his sons became a uh, an Orthodox priest, which I even uh, attended um, his, um, uh, you could say, uh, uh, coronation to uh, become an, uh, an Orthodox priest. Well, anyhow, uh, I, I found that, uh, you know, a lot of times, at least spiritually speaking, uh, you really should go to a, uh, um, you know, a pastor, a priest, uh, somebody in the, uh, uh, you know, the monastic uh, life, because so many times they are like that. I know that the Orthodox Church uh, has, you know, outreach programs where mm -hmm. they will uh, uh, try to... Uh, Reconcile with these uh, uh, ill people, uh, both in the hospital and sometimes even in the uh, prisons. Okay. Now, Greg brought up a couple of points that um, insurance. How does that play a role in, you know, diagnose or having a death certificate read, you know, by by suicide? Does it ever say that, or is it, you know? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know how to answer okay. that, but Greg, I'm really sorry for your loss. Um, it's complicated, though, with religion. People who feel depressed and desperate and suicidal and are religious have a very hard time. They know that their religion forbids it. They know that that's what they're thinking of. They feel complex, difficult feelings. They don't know where to turn. They're afraid that if they go to uh, their pastor, they'll be told, just stop it, don't think like that, and they know they can't stop it. Sometimes they can get relief from an understanding clergyman or woman, but it's very complex, and I don't think we can simply tell people, get religion. Religion is complicated, and actually for the very religious people who are suicidal, it's even harder. I know uh, at um, the North Shore Walk, I cannot speak for all walks because they're run by Understood. the individuals who run them, but um, we make a point to have, we have um, nurses on scene, we have paramedics on scene, we have mental health professionals on scene, and we're talking an array of, from, from uh, counselors to doctors, and we also, we always make a point to have clergy there with the understanding okay. that it's a non-denominational event, that they need to be able to speak to whoever. Um, but it's there because the day is filled with so much emotion mm -hmm. um, because we're celebrating the lives of those we've lost as well as providing support for those who are struggling, as well as trying to put out our word and our message and bring about awareness um, okay. for both the topic of suicide as well as the topic of mental illness, that we want to make sure uh, people who are having difficulty with the emotion of that day, we make sure that we have every aspect of potential counseling there for you, whatever means is oh, going okay. to be. Because it, it is different for everyone. Um, there's going to be many people who want nothing to do with the religious aspect of it. There's going to be those who struggle with their beliefs mm -hmm. versus what I, I, when my cousin died, I struggled with, with that. I was brought up um, Catholic and it is an absolute no-no and we had a non-denominational um, individual do her service. And his words, I found, he worded it in such a way that was very comforting for me. Um, uh, so for, for that, it, 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 it brought me peace over, over her decision okay. um, it, to be able to help me move on. And, um, but there are people who want, they, they want a, a, an actual medical person. Um, some don't believe in, in just mm -hmm. counseling. Um, they want that person to be a doctor or a nurse. And then there are others who want the counselor because they feel that that's what they're trained to do. Okay. So we make sure at the North Shore Walk in Wakefield that, that all aspects of guidance um, and or counseling is available to the participants of our event so that if they're having difficulty that day, it's available to them. Great. Well, Greg, thank you very much. I'm not sure if you're still on the line or not, but thank you. Um, I do appreciate your feedback and your questions because it did bring up a lot of 
mm. a lot of issues. So speaking of, you know, the counseling and the support systems, I don't feel, I, I don't want to, you know, keep beating the proverbial dead horse, but what are some of the support systems for families who have been impacted by a loved one having taken their own lives? I mean, are there opportunities for you to get together with others other than the walk, you know, to lead up to the walk? Or well, one of the things that we do at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention is we have a National Suicide Awareness Day, okay. and that's the Saturday before Thanksgiving. And we have, um, we, we have it on the internet and we have it at many locations, okay. there are at least two in Boston and several throughout the state, where people get an opportunity to come together and feel that they're not alone in mourning the, the death of a loved one and trying to deal with suicide. We also put on um, other support uh, meetings once or twice a year to okay. help survivors of suicide loss. But there are a tremendous amount of support groups out there. And if, if you do reach out to the, the local chapters, um, the Greater Boston Chapter, the, the directors, we have um, two, currently have two directors in, in the Eastern Mass area. And um, if you reach out to one of our, our chapter directors, they, they have the means and the connections, the right and they can, they can point you in the right direction. I cannot speak intelligently about it, um, other than I do know um, that they, they train their volunteers that are trained to run support groups and things like that. And there are people out there doing it constantly. That was not a route that I chose to go. Um, but the, it is out there and it is happening. I, I am aware of them. I, I, I even know people who do them, but I okay. couldn't, you would need to reach out to the, the Greater Boston Chapter to find out who's in your area okay. and they can put you in contact. Do you have anything to add? Uh, no, just the, the one thing I would add is that the feeling of loss is a terrible one and it's hard to make sense of what happened. Being amongst other people who've gone through it can sometimes help. Sometimes it feels um, so lonely and nobody else can understand. And that might be a very powerful feeling. But Sometimes being amongst others who've lost a child or others who've lost a spouse, uh, it's not exactly the same, but sometimes you can notice that there is a sense of like commonalities. commonality and recognition and grieving. Okay. Now, we've talked a lot about you know, support where the person is contacting you and they're make, taking a more you know, um, not Pro proactive, act. but th they're coming to you. Does the foundation provide, or what um, outreach does the foundation provide to get the word out that there is help available? Well, we have these walks, and we try okay. and publicize things through the media about the walks. Okay. Uh, we don't do a good enough job, so some people don't know about it, that there is such a thing as support after a loss to suicide. But thanks to people like you, we're letting everybody know that um, suicide happens and the grieving is very hard and the painful loss is difficult, but other people are going through it too and it's not something that um, we should hide. And like Jeannie said before, just talk about it and talk. Well, and talk additionally, and additionally, the um, most of the local chapters across the country, um, specifically Boston, yes, um, as well as a lot of the walks, almost all of us have Facebook pages. So if you if you go on Facebook and search mm -hmm. suicide prevention, you're going to find things in your in your community okay. we um the, again the north shore walk wakefield walk <laughs> wakefield walk for suicide prevention like our page um but it, um on facebook it is a community where people post like someone who was struggling getting assistance and other people chimed in and said i did this and i did that so it's the place for people to come together okay. um and a lot of times with facebook it's like almost an anonymity where it's not like face to face it's you know electronic so you can kind of right and we have people on our page people who like okay. our page followers of our page who are 
people who struggle personally. Um, and again, you know this by their posts. You know by what they're what they're looking to get out of the page. Okay. Um, and um, we also have loved ones who are trying to get people help, okay. or loved ones who have just lost somebody and want that connection with someone else who has lost somebody. It, it, it it's a safe place for people to come together mm -hmm. and to communicate and share ideas. Again, because unfortunately out there, there is stigma, which we're working AFSP and all of our, our multitude of um, volunteers are trying okay. to erase stigma. It, p mental illness, again, is illness. It is not something anyone chose mm -hmm. to have. Um, where by bringing about the awareness and by creating safe places for people to come and to talk about it and to share their stories, where the word is going to get out there. And again, I, I, the doctor mm -hmm. said it earlier, just talk about it. Okay. Now on the website, I saw something called the Advocacy Forum. Can either of you fill me in a little more on what that is? So at AFSP, we do several things. One is we provide help to survivors, which we just talked about. The other big thing we do is we collect money and we subsidize research. So we use a lot of the money that we collect okay. from the walks that we're talking about. That's how we fundraise and we use that for research into suicide prevention. The third thing we do is advocacy. So on a national state and local level, we advocate for better laws to help people with mental illness and suicide prevention. And having a national health care is a big step forward. Okay. Having universal health care in Massachusetts has made a big difference. Big difference in a good way? Yes, in a good <laughs> way in helping people who have psychiatric illness get help, get treatment. People who didn't previously have medical coverage now have medical coverage. Uh, okay. So how would someone go about becoming an advocate? Can they do that? Is it like? No, that's something that AFSP does. Okay. And if you want to get involved with AFSP, we welcome you and call us and uh, join in. But uh, it's only a few people go, go to Washington and actually talk to our senators and Congress people and advocate for these laws. Okay. It's, it's a small part of what we do. OK. I, I do have literature on that. I can email you personally. Um, about the process, I don't have it with me. I just, you know, I was looking through the website to try to generate some questions in my cheat sheet because I am, I love going on tangents. And that would be a place for people to seek okay. more information if they they want to put okay. themselves in that role. And I'm like, wow, that seems pretty cool. You know, what is this? Now you had mentioned research. What kind of research has the foundation been doing? Is it for new medications or is it therapies or is there you know some other well it's a range of things that, we know, variable we tr we need to understand what makes somebody kill themselves my own opinion is it's an internal subjective experience that is so horrible that they just can't stand it but that's just my own people we, we need studies to figure out what makes somebody feel so bad and how we can help and so there's many studies that we're funding to try and clarify this, uh, both who's at risk, what makes them at risk, and what can help them. Now, with some of these research projects, is it all based on statistics, or do you get, like, case studies? And just wondering how you'd recruit volunteers for a study in suicide prevention? Well, often you want to find people who have a mental illness. You start okay. with that. Usually it's with depression. Sometimes it's bipolar illness. Okay. Sometimes you want to compare them to people who are not currently depressed, don't have any mental illness. Um, but mostly the research has to do, there are epidemiologic studies trying to get a sense of which groups of people are more at risk. Okay. But usually what we fund has to do with different um, diagnoses and treatments. And like I said before, the main diagnosis that's involved with suicide is depression. Okay. Affective disorders like bipolar disease and depression. And, and their research often then lends itself to the implementation of programs. Uh, they have the interactive screening program 
um, which is an intake questionnaire that's used at colleges uh, for law enforcement, and they may be tweaked for the different um, okay. venues, mm. but they're, they're intake screening, so you already identify folks who may be more at risk that are going to be in your, your controlled oh, okay. population. Um, and I did bring literature um, that I will give you um, okay. on that, um, but again, that is something that came directly out of their, um, out of one of their research trials was um, that there is a series of questions you can ask to um, sort of assign a risk potential okay. um, to an individual, um, particularly in different controlled pools, such as the college student age or um, okay. the, the, that, the law enforcement dynamic. And they have those programs that they have rolled out um, in the different areas. We, we've tried to intervene at uh, people who are at most risk, and there's a high risk in certain college populations, there's a high risk in certain other jobs, and so we've developed a questionnaire that tries to identify which of these people in that these okay. subgroups uh, may be at risk and how to encourage them to see a professional to get some help. Okay. Now, with all of this research being done, I know we already talked about the walks, but we only have a few minutes left, so I want to talk about um, how someone can get involved in the walks or in the foundation. You know, what are volunteer opportunities um, that someone can come and volunteer their time and learn more about the process so he or she might be able to go and, you know, do their own little advocacy? Well, contact us. Go to our website, afsp.org, um, click on anything over there and tell you a lot about what we do and how you can get involved. There's many ways to get involved from joining in the walks, as Jeannie will tell you, uh, donating money, um, joining any of the groups that we have. Okay. Tell me a little more. I'm just thinking about the overnight walk. You had mentioned it you know, before we started the whole show, and you say it's you walk throughout the evening? I mean, do you walk around a track? Is it like a 5K? Uh, or? Actually, the overnight in Boston is just over, just over 16 miles, and okay. it starts in the evening, and they have a, a series of activities for people to do. There's memorial activities where you can honor um, the person you've lost okay. or support those who are struggling, and there's typically um, various activities that will go on at any of those types of events. Okay. And they have a commencement ceremony where, with speakers who, who speak on the various topics uh, that are in, mm -hmm. in the spotlight on any given year. Um, and the overnight is just, it, like I said, it's a, it, it's a really huge event because um, the whole point of calling our walks out of the darkness is because we're bringing suicide and mental illness out of the darkness and into the light. And our overnight walk is just, it, just to feed into that whole concept of we are going to walk throughout, we are going to walk into the darkness and come out in the light. And um, we are going to bring with it um, awareness and um, funding and support um, okay. to, to... Now, are there teams that walk? Because, you know, when you're mm -hmm. talking about, like, the overnight, all I can think of is... You can walk American as a... Cancer Society Relay You can walk as a team of one, or you can walk as a team of 100. That is okay. entirely up to you. And you walk the whole thing. It is like a walk-a-thon. It's not well, like a... Well, let me... No, oh, let okay. me say, you, you do not... I don't want to discourage anyone who doesn't walk. Okay. Um, the important thing about the walks, any of the walks, whether it be the overnight or the other ones, is show up. We have people that we refer to as, when you register, you can register as a virtual walker. So you're a walker, but oh, I if, like that. If, you're, if you're unable to, don't want to, or, or what, whatever reason, okay. cannot walk or can't, can't walk that distance, um, you can just show up. You can register, or you don't even have to show up if you register as a virtual walker. You can participate that way. You register, you go out and you get your supporters, you bring, a, you bring about the awareness to your friends, your family, the mailman, your hairdresser, and the guy you held the door for at the supermarket. And um, by registering as a virtual walker, you're getting your numbers on the books, whether that, the number of participants is 
is almost as important as the amount of uh, money raised. And I okay. say that because when we're looking for backing on some of these bills and some of these these things okay. nationally, the politicians are going to back the event that has thousands of people showing up versus the event okay. that has two people showing up. So whether you participate as a volunteer, mm -hmm. a donor, a vendor, a walker, a virtual walker, Whatever it is, uh, we had official huggers at our walk. We had official huggers. <laughs> they stood at the finish line and they hugged everyone as they came across. Oh the, uh, they yes, they and they had signs with free hugs and they hugged everyone as they came across the finish line. And um, but the overnight again, it's it, it's it goes throughout Boston. You pass landmarks. It has a starting wow. point and a finish point. Um, and again, just some wonderful, wonderful moving events. And to be there with that number of people is just so powerful and so moving. And you're really sending a message because those who haven't heard about us or don't know about us mm -hmm. will come to know about us because they're going to see this group and they're going to wonder what that's about and they're going to read the signs and the banners. So whether you're a team of one or a team of 100, you can participate. You can participate whether you walk or whether you bring your lawn chair and sit there and wait for the rest to return. You can participate. We've we've had people in their little motorized scooters. We've had people pushed. Be my segue. We've yes. had people pushed in wheelchairs. We've had people who wanted to run it. As a matter of fact, we had three wa three runners in the Boston Marathon this past week. Really supporting AFSP. Yes, we did. Excellent. And you were one of them. Well, no. <laughs> it's, it's twofold in my mind. Okay. We we have these walks to raise money. It's a big fundraiser, and it's like the National Cancer Association. We we make a lot of our um, donations come from that, and we also the second part is to increase awareness, and perhaps the biggest part is the support people get of being around others who care deeply about lo loved ones who've died by suicide. Excellent. Well, we are just about out of time. We have a minute left. So when is the Boston Walk? The, the, uh, the, the Boston over Overnight. The Overnight is June 27th. June 27th. When can you register? Anytime. Anytime. Go, to, go to the Overnight. If you Google the Overnight, you, there, it has its own page out there. You can cool. get a link. You can get a link through the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, which is AFSP.org. Okay. Um, there's a link for the Overnight. There's a link for the community walks. Those are the, the local walks taking place on your college campuses this spring okay. or in your local communities this fall. And if you have family members that live across the country, there is one near them. They're all over the country. There were more than 300 walks last year. Okay. So I just participate. Come right. out and participate. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for I having us. I learned a thank lot. You for having and hopefully, us. I didn't create too many social taboos. But thank you. I learned a great deal, and hopefully, our audience did. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in this evening. Hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did, and I will see you around town. Have a great evening. Thanks.